So tonight, um, I would like to introduce Julie Smolanski, who'll be moderating this book. This was a book that um, she chose because it spoke to her. And I want to tell you a little bit about, about Julie. Julie became the youngest. Julie sits on our board and has been a longtime supporter of Illinois Holocaust Museum. And she became the youngest female CEO of a publicly held firm when she took over Lifeway Foods at the age of 27 in 2002. Um, she, she's continued the company's growth trajectory with creative product development and marketing to bring Kiefer, the company's flagship product, into the U.S. mainstream. And under her leadership, she's expanded distribution and been named to the Fortune, Fortune Business 40 Under 40, Fortune's 55 Most Influential Women in Twitter, um, and a number of other business accolades. Uh, more related to the Holocaust Museum in this book, she has a bachelor's degree from University of Illinois at Chicago and is an emeritus member of the United Nations Foundation Global Entrepreneurs Council and was a part of the 2015 class of young global leaders in, in, of the World Economic Forum. She's produced several documentaries, including the Home Stretch, Honor Dar Diaries, Hunting Games, and most recently on the record. So in 2013, Julie co-founded a not-for-profit test for a 1K, 400K, test 400K, an organization dedicated to adv advocating ending the backlog of 40, 400,000 untested rape kits in the US. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to Julie, who's gonna get us going on the book. Oh, I neglected the, the you know, she, she's also lives in Chicago and is the mother of two young girls. So we can't forget family, also important to all of us. So with that, Julie, why don't you take it away and talk a little bit about this book? Thank you so much. It's, it's so great to be with you all. Um, thank you to Marcy and Michelle and um, Susan and the entire um, Holocaust Museum staff, the board members, supporters, um, friends, um, all the docents, the volunteers. I know it takes a village um, and I'm so, so proud um, and humble to be part of that village. Um, the museum is something so near and dear to my heart. Um, uh, my family um, is uh, are descendants of survivors of the Holocaust, of uh, victims of the Holocaust. Um, for those of you who don't know, yeah, I'm the CEO of Lifeway Foods, this, uh, the Kiefer company, not too far from the museum, just a few blocks away. And um, my family and I were among the first refugees in 1976 who settled in Chicago. We were the first of 48 families that were allowed to settle through a small slit in the Iron Curtain. Um, in large part, you know, my father wanted to leave the Soviet Union. Um, because of the unfairness, inequality, the um, you know violence that he experienced as a Jew, um, and uh, did not want that for me. And there are so many, um, I guess, threads of similarities in in different ways that you know I think that we feel from Mandela and. Um, in, with the museum, uh, it gave my family a place to have space to honor my relatives. My great grandmother was murdered in her home in Kiev when the Nazis stormed her town and took it over. And my grandmother ran into the forest and hid as a teenager and was on the run throughout the war and survived. Um, and, you know, I am alive because of the resilience, um, the, the, um, you know, <laughs> miracles, I guess, that um, carried my family forward. And from the time that I learned of the Holocaust, when I read Anne Frank, it has never left me. Um, and I think about it all the time. And I think about the legacy that um, my relatives will leave, that the Holocaust leaves on all of us. Um, the legacy that Fritzi has left on us, um, the legacy that you know Mandela has left on us. And there are so many threads of similarity. I'm sure you can all agree and, and see them. Um, and when I first 
learned of the Holocaust. I could not rectify the concept of forgiveness. Um, I still struggle with it. I still, I still do. Even you know, rereading this book for this book club, um, I still um, have a hard time with it. But I will say that hearing Mandela, listening to Mandela in his own words, with his own lessons and the gifts that he has imparted on us, um, it gives me comfort. It gives me something to strive for. And I'm sure to all of you, it does the same. I'm sure that we can all, you know, go through this book and find so many, you know, tidbits of, of great guidance of, of how to lead and, and, and how to live, um, how to be Mandela's way, you know, what, what that essence is. And I guess, you know, he is so, um, they call him like Santa Claus, right? They say that he's been such a, a Santa Claus figure and, and mystified. But I think that what Mandela's Way really does well by, um, by Richard Sengel is kind of show the man of Mandela, the complexities, the nuances, that it's not just black and white, that there is a gray, that there is, um, it's both. You know, this this concept that it can be both. It's a complex con concept that I continue to struggle with because we want to have one, you know, uh, we want clarity. But I think what I've learned from reading more about Mandela and learning more about his life is that as humans, we're complex and that both is important, holding space for both sides. Um, and you know, I there's there's just so many great great pieces of of uh, you know <laughs> guidance, I guess you know leadership skills, uh, things that I aspire to, like being measured. You know, I don't know how many of us are measured. I'm not good at that, but I strive to. Um, and I just love the the beginning, the preface that if if we are to accomplish anything in this world, it will equal it will in equal measure be due to the work and achievement of others. And that just reminds me so much about what the museum stands for and what we all contribute um, towards the museum that, you know, if we're gonna um, have a successful, uh, you know, uh, community that, that if we learn the lessons of the Holocaust that it will be in because of all of us together in community. Um, but, you know, I don't want to just sit and talk. This was sort of just my little introduction about some of my kind of takeaways, thoughts that are, are coming to me. I definitely, you know, as you can see, I read a lot. I have so many books. It's my favorite thing. And I'd love to just um, talk about the book and like what you all think. And I know there's a bunch of docents here that I am so excited to learn from and get a better sense of um, some of these lessons and what you have learned in the process of, you know, either coming for coming together for book club or I know the Mandela exhibit is going on now. Lifeway is a sponsor of it. We definitely feel like those lessons are so important and Again, like I just for me, the concept of forgiveness and when I think about what Mandela has left us, um, that's one of the best lessons for me, one of the greatest lessons. And I will continue to struggle with that, I think, for a long time. Um, but yeah. Um, well, I'd love to, you know, open it up for just conversation, what you thought of the book. Did you like it? Did you not? Were you surprised by anything? I definitely had a few surprises um, that, you know, kind of struck out to me that, that I was like, wow, I, I'm surprised that they, you know, wrote about such and such and, and be eager to hear what you all thought. Maybe someone just can. a reminder too, if your video is on, you can raise your hand. You could raise your hand virtually in the participants bar, or you can write a comment in the chat and we'll read it. So please participate in whatever way works for you. Any surprises from the book?
Are we just figuring out the technology or? Does someone want to start the conversation with an impression or a thought or? No. I know it's so stressful to be the first to raise your hand and but jump, feel free, please jump right in. Um, you know, what's something that maybe has inspired you by Mandela or maybe something within the museum or the exhibit that maybe, you know, hit close to home for you, maybe if there is anything. Yeah. Hey, Mark. Okay, well, I'll, I'll start. One thing that I found endearing was and I, I, I don't remember who exactly who the figures were, but M Mandela would, um, he, he would find, if it was an adversary, whether it was an adversary or a friend, he would find out what they like. Um, and I don't remember, was it Botha or de Klerk? Uh, you know, the, one of them was really into rugby, right? And uh, of course, rugby, <laughs> was not you know the 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 favorite the favorite sport of the black population it was right so uh nonetheless uh mandela made it a point to learn before i do either of you rem, do any of you remember who who was he meeting with it was it was the uh it was the president i don't remember which one but he made a point of talking about the rugby scores and what's going on and the people um, he made a point of learning about the the uh, the history of the of the Dutch in South Africa. He made a point of learning Afrikaans, all all to better communicate with those that he he was he was going to have to negotiate with, you know. And I I think of uh, you know people that I didn't particularly like say at work or other places. And, and you know, it was not um, something that I was necessarily prone to do is, hmm, let me, what do they like? I'm gonna make a point of really <laughs> learning, you know, what really, what really moves them. I was more into, no, no, you know, I'm right, they're wrong. So I, I that was something that I found uh, really, really sweet and, and good advice. Yeah, that, um that game, the, the rugby was such a uh, important piece of his leadership. And, uh, you know, it sounds like very monumental in his success as a politician, you know, as I um, had been, you know, learning more, he was really a true, uh, like a statesman, like he, he got political theater, he understood those small touches that were, uh, you know, critical for his success in, in his leadership. Um, so I totally agree with you. Did you get to see Invictus? I did. It was a fantastic movie. And I read the, after that, I read the book. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if anyone hasn't seen, uh, I'm sure you all have, but Invictus kind of really highlights that that rugby um, tournament and and how important it was for for him and for um, the the you know the country. Um, so yeah, I totally uh, remember that. Um, anyone else? Does anyone else have other thoughts or impressions? Um, things that stick out. Um, I'm just like looking through some of my underlinings and <laughs> so many, it's like the whole thing is underlined. Um, there's just uh, so much here. Trying to find some of the, does anyone so, else? Um, I might ask a question. I know many people in this book club log on um, to hear the conversation, maybe having not read the book or looking forward to reading the book. I'm wondering if why that maybe with a smaller group in the middle of the summer, there's more of that. And if there is, I think maybe where we take it, Julie, is to just read some really meaningful segments of the book and then open it up to the group 
for conversation or reaction to the segments. Um, sure. How does that sound to folks? Yeah. yeah. Does anyone have any other kind of ideas or thoughts or, you know, questions that before we start reading some of the, um, the, the passages? I have a lot of really awesome ones that I love. But here, let me look for some of these. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I mean, I was just one of the things that um, one of the things that, you know, really, I don't know if I guess it would, I would say that it like, it, it really hurt to see was uh, his space in the, um, in his prison cell that he was, you know, held in for 27 years. And it, seeing it, you know, I've not, I was, I have not been there myself, but, you know, I've seen images of it and the museum, you know, has, has some of those, um, but, you know, the, the pain of knowing that the greatest years of this man's life were spent in this cell that he couldn't even stretch out in. And I wonder if that's maybe where, where his uh, love for, well, I, I guess he started, he fell in love with rugby too, but I, I wonder if that, some of that like athleticism was something that came from, um, his, uh, you know, prison sentence, um, because that really, um, I don't know, it just pained me to, to know. And I, you know, again, it's one of those moments where I think about the people who suffered in the Holocaust and, you know, I, I, I don't understand how people were able to get, how he was able to get through um, 27 years in the cell. It just, it's, you know, talk about being measured and the need for uh, stillness and calmness. I mean, it's superhuman, you know, it's just absolutely superhuman. Um, but the other thing that really struck, kind of was highlighted for me was all of the contradictions of Mandela. You know, he, um, he loved celebrityism. You know, he. I was playing U2 for when at the start of this because you know he, him and Bono shared a great bond, and um, you know he has rock stars and models and you know all these these you know superstars that are he counted as his friends, um, and yet he was a man of the people. So um, I'm look, looking at uh, page 209. This is on the um, the end uh, where it, it's always both, um, which I again I have a, a struggle with the the concept. But Nelson Mandela is comfortable with contradictions, even his own. When I was with him, I sometimes thought of the line from Walt Whitman's Song of Myself: "Do I contradict myself? Well, very well. Then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes." He is large, he does contain multitudes, and he often contradicts himself. He understands that consistency for its own sake is a false virtue and that inconsistency is not automatically a flaw. He knows that humans are complex creatures and that people have a myriad of motives. During an interview, I at once asked Mandela, did you embrace the armed struggle because you thought nonviolence would never defeat apartheid or because it was the only way to keep the ANC from splintering apart? And then, I, you know, more goes on and, you know, he, a little bit towards the middle of the page, he answers, Richard, why not both? Why not both? I often posed questions in that binary manner. Was it some, was something this way or that way? Was the reason A or B, yes or no? Early on, I saw that this frustrated him because for Mandela, the answer is almost always both. It's never as simple as yes or no. He knows that the reason behind any action is rarely clear. There are no simple answers to mo the most difficult questions. All explanations may be true. 
and every problem has many causes, not just one. That is the way Nelson Mandela sees the world. So I don't know. I think that, you know, I always want an answer. And I think we as humans, we want an answer. Um, we want to see people as, you know, good or bad. Um, I think even now more than ever, we have this sense of like, it's us and them. Um, but, and it has splintered our culture so much, um, I think. I think society has just become so um, demanding of, you know, one or the other. And it's, it's great to remember that it's both, that it can be both, that there are complexities. Um, I'm wondering what you guys think about that concept, because it was really kind of, it really distills, I think, who he was. And even in, um, you know, the, Richard writes about how when it came time to divorcing Winnie, that it was perhaps the most painful personal decision of his life, that he still saw that there was so much good in her, but knew that he needed to do this. And it was precisely because he was able to hold both good and bad in his mind at once, that the memory of what he loved best in her and the knowledge that she was hurting him in that decision was so excruciating for him. But I think that is so, um, it's wisdom. You know, this is, this is one of his wisdoms. Um, I'll chime in. Yeah, let's hear I it. think it's interesting to think about the weighing of all options and understanding reason in the context of leadership, because leaderships, leaders are expected to project a path forward. And so sometimes when people have all these different views, it's more, it's, it's perceived to be wishy-washy. So I think it's really interesting of how he could be such a strong leader when he had this understanding that there could be so many different reasons, explanations or parallel paths. And he was able to have that sense, but then also understanding that and still propel you know, up and project a path forward in, in a sense of leadership. Yeah, I definitely agree with you. Um, so any thoughts on kind of leadership or what leadership means or how it relates today or seeing all different sides? We've introduced a number of concepts in this mini, mini discussion. I'm interested uh -huh. if anyone wants to jump in. But at the same time, Marcy, he said if something violated his core principle, he would not compromise on that. So it sounds like, you know, the core principle was dismantling the, the whole racist system, but it, it, it sounds like there were some fundamentals that there was no negotiation on, but the means to the end, there could be, there, there, there could be some give and take, unlike, uh, you know, the, uh, the group, the ANC, you know, he had disputes with them because they weren't able to compromise as he as he was. Mm -hmm. So, so was I, what I thought was interesting is he would he 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 could see the nuance up to up to a point, mm -hmm. but but then at at some point he's got to he he would say no no I'm not I'm not compromising any on this principle. So I would distinguish between principle and maybe means. So, yeah, so there was a guiding light. There was a direction. Interesting. Any thoughts? Well, and then I thought it was like also interesting, though, that even though he was uncompromising, he, when he got new information, he was op open to pivoting. He was open to a different perspective or changing his mind. And um, on page 70, Richard writes, in his life, Mandela often changed his mind when circumstances change. To him, that is a simple common, that is simple common sense. When he sees what he regards as the inevitable, he will alter his point of view, but he does not turn on a dime. He likes to examine all the consequences of reversing himself. Only then he will act. Um, to the outside, his actions can, see, can seem pre precipitous, but inside he will have already thought it through. He would 
say, don't postpone the inevitable, even though it might not be the solution you originally wanted. So it's like he was uncompromising unless he got, you know, a new new perspective. And, you know, we just celebrated his birthday. And um, I was like reading about how like some of his teachers, you know, he was, you know, reading, um, oh, I don't know, I think like, uh, Robert Frost or something and the they were saying how like his professors were actually alive during the time when you know these uh world famous you know writers were were writing and that you know he had to he was born before the internet before um any you know a lot of modern things and he had to change his his perspective is he had to change his thought you know one thing is um, he was a member of the Communist Party. And, you know, I don't know how I feel about that, you know, given like my family escaped. These are one of these complexities. You know, my family escaped communism and um, he regarded uh, Omar Gaddafi and uh, uh, who's the other one? Um, oh my God. And Fidel Castro as, as you know, heroes. And, uh, at the time, the Communist Party was the only party that allowed um, Black people to be a member of, of their party out of all the other parties. So, you know, I can, I, that made me like understand why he chose to be a part of it. But, you know, I wonder if like those are one of the flaws that, you know, to regard kind of these, these major human rights violators as heroes you know, why, why didn't he um, change his position on them? And that, that's one of the complexities of Mandela that we can still, you know, hold him in high regards, but then have empathy for where he came from, I guess. I don't know how you all feel about that. <laughs> In the museum, do you guys go through like some of those, um, the, the multiple sides of him? Is that something that, that you guys kind of dive into? I mean, the exhibition really showcases the, the, the rise of the apart, apartheid and the apartheid laws, and then the movement to a free in democratic South Africa. So it really takes a historical perspective with Nelson Mandela as its central character, but it it's really not necessarily 100% focused on Mandela. It's focused on you, you know, towards the end is when um, it, 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 there's a major youth part of the movement that's really showcased in the museum. And there's a, the early part of the exhibition really talks about how the apartheid laws came to be and what their impact was on the black population. So it's it's a it's a broader communication of the story. Again, our language says with Nelson Mandela as its central figure, but yeah. it's it's bigger than that. Yeah. Does anyone else want to comment on the exhibition? Has anyone seen it or seen the virtual group tour? Hi, um, I'm I'm calling in from Washington. Um, I'm sorry, I, I I couldn't hear everything, but I do wonder how you are now going to handle where South Africa is. The fissions and the cleavages in South Africa are displayed for everyone to see, and lives and supports and vocations have been upended. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done and a lot of the frailties of post-apartheid South Africa are in view. And I wonder how the museum docents are going to handle these developments. I think your timing is so apropos with this question. Um, we have a program coming 
August 8th mm -hmm. um, with L.B. Sachs and Erwin Kotler. Oh, and, um, and they're going to be talking about what, you know, their role um, in South Africa and, and kind of what's going on now. And then, um, so I think that, I think as always with the museum, it's a conversation and we, we try to be hosting conversations that you know, use history to connect to current day. So I think the two of them talking um, will be really interesting and, and help the entire community start to understand some of those questions, particularly if they're asked through the Q and A. Um, my, my tongue in cheek response is that we only have the exhibition through September 12th. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, maybe we need to do a, a quick update with the docents on how to answer some of these questions, but probably not the investment that we would in, in terms of training. Mm -hmm. We're just opening the exhibition. Well, I hope you'll record the, the talks by these two gentlemen. And the rest of us, I, I'm probably not going to go to Chicago and, and hear them, but I certainly would be interested. Um, I did um, go to Durham. Mindy, there, it's a virtual program, and the oh. exhibition is available virtually as well. So just visit our website. You'll get access to I, all of that I, stuff. I absolutely will. And then the fate of the Jewish community in South Africa, I'm sure, is being rethought by some. And... Um, their decisions will play out over the next months and years also. Yeah, I mean, again, we've had the opportunity to have a historical perspective and we, through an advisory board and through some programming, have had the perspective of the Jewish community who left and why they left and how they feel and what they knew and what they didn't know. Um, but probably not as much as um, how it relates to current day and what's going on. So thank you for your comment. Oh, thank you for doing this. Any does, other? It, does anyone have any other um, kind of impressions from, uh, from the book or the museum or current events or things happening in the world? I really um, also just loved um, the lesson of finding your own garden. And I think that's like also so um, important in these days when, you know, I keep hearing about kind of in a post COVID world, how there's so much, you know, mental health challenges and, um, you know, uh, languishing. They, I think the New York Times said the word of the year is languish. And um, I love that, you know, he really understood, I don't know, I don't want to say self-care, but, you know, he was able to convince the prison guards to let him build a, start a garden. And he was able to negotiate his way towards accessing seeds. And he started growing his own food and then giving the the harvest to the the guards and their families and you know really i i would say creating allegiances and um you know favors and whatnot which probably went very far but yeah um you know he he believes that everybody um needs a place where they can lose themselves to find themselves and uh, I love that idea, a place to lose yourself to find yourself. I am gonna hold that. Um, I often feel the same way, not only in nature, but just like as I'm doing things that bring me joy. Um, I remember that that concept of how, how important it is to, um, to do that. And, and again, it was, um, uh, here, they, 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 Richard writes, on Robben Island, where there were few pleasures, Mandela's garden had become his own private island. 
It quieted his mind. It distracted him from his constant worries about the outside world, his family and the freedom struggle. While so much was withering outside, his garden was thriving. Mandela has always had powers of concentration and the other prisoners noted how absorbed he was when he was gardening. He got lost in it. And I love that because it, it makes me feel like he had, you know, some, um, some control over his, his world. Um, they, you know, he goes on to write, in a world where he had no privacy and very few possessions, the garden had become a bit of land that was entirely his. In a world that he could not control, that defied and punished him, that he seemed hostile to, his values and his dreams, it had been a place of beauty and regularity and renewal. Effort was rewarded. The seasons changed in regular order. Seeds turned into plants, stalks rose, leaves sprouted. And he used the metaphors of gardening um, in his, you know, kind of day to day. Um, and so I think, you know, and, and Richard writes, for Mandela, his life was in service of other to others, and the garden was a respite from the turmoil and storms of the world. In that way, it helped him do his main work. It was not a place of retreat, but of renewal. So I really, uh, really love that too. The main thing that each of us needs is something away from the world that gives us pleasure and satisfaction, a place apart. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. Um, How did those in this group accomplish that in their lives? We have gardeners, artists. You know, how do you how do you find that peace or that contemplative space? <coughs> no one, no one wants to share. I will share. I have a little platform garden, and when I pick lettuce or something that I grew from seed, it, it's, it's, it, it, there's joy, there's pure joy in that. It's really interesting that something so little can give so much. Right. Yeah. I think it's a great lesson for all of us. And, and one that I, you know, hope to kind of, um, I, I think it, I think, you know, what he, he was the, the beginning of self-care. He was like the founder of self-care, let's say, uh, very early on, I think, uh, realized that to get through the, the hardship of what he was overcoming and, and surviving in, um, that he needed to have this escape, this dissociation into um, a, a respite to, to his, his world of, of garden um, and gardening. I know he read a lot of newspapers and uh, I think that also was probably, although raises your anxiety. <laughs> Reading news raises anxiety, so more gardening to read more newspapers probably. But um, yeah, I think that is, uh, uh, you know, something just, again, it, it's, it's a lesson that we can, uh, carry to other generations and give permission to people who, you know, feel like um, they're unworthy of having, uh, you know, joy or peace in their lives. Like hearing that, you know, Mandela really uh, kind of craved this, this space um, and held it to high regard. Um, it just gives gives us all permission to find peace and joy and those things that bring us um, that bring us joy. Uh, if I could, if I could say something, I, uh, yes. this is fascinating about the garden, and I haven't read the book, so I'll have to do that. But obviously, there were people who wanted Mandela to survive, if not thrive, because they could have stopped the garden. They could have trampled what was growing, they could have destroyed this, but they didn't. Does the book talk about those who wished this to survive and enable Mandela to survive? Yeah, um, they kind of go through, Richard kind of talks about how um, he, uh, 
he was rueful and recalling that he could not grow peanuts. I must confess that my knowledge of how to grow peanuts was not so good, they never thrived. But he recalled with great pride how the commanding officers once asked the warders to get him a cutting of Mandela spinach because the plants had grown so tall. I took a lot of pride in that garden. On Sundays, I used to supply the whole kitchen staff with vegetables. Oh. Yes, every Sunday. So people noticed he was doing well and then enabled it. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. Yes, yes. And um, Michelle, you can help too. In, um, we read another book, it, oh, The Letters of Mandela. And you know, when he first entered prison, he had no rights. And he wrote letter after letter to person after person after person to slowly over the years expand the rights for prisoners. And so, you know, that garden, I'm not sure at what point in his imprisonment, he was able to establish that garden, but getting to the point where he had that was a years long effort, you know, and many, many letters written to many, many people. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. Um, you know, another thing this and this maybe is is maybe more, um, I don't know, personal for me, but I think probably all of us who are here probably feel the same work or the same um, sense and why we are all involved with the museum. I think it kind of uh, goes back to this particular lesson. It's kind of distills what he was all about kind of in, in whole. Um, one of the things that Mandela sought through was his own sacrifice that someday our fathers and mothers would not have to say the same words to their sons and daughters, that his son might inherit a free nation. He would not have to fight for the freedom that should have, that should have been his birthright. In a larger way, Mandela wants there to be a thread between his life, his values, his achievements, and everyone who comes after him. As unique as he might be, he would tell you that he's part of a long chain of leadership, a continuum of those who came before us and those who will succeed us, a great and powerful chain of those fighting to enlarge human freedom. And I just, that just distills what the museum is. It distills Fritzy and Sam Harris and what all of us, you know, all of us are working on is that idea that we stand on the shoulders of those who came before us, who suffered so greatly um, and, and do this work and, you know, sacrifice in our own ways so that, you know, our children don't have to. And I think about my work with um, you know, sexual assault and uh, the rape kits and my organization that I started. Um, and it was in large part, you know, that I wanted to do this, this very taboo work um, and have these really hard conversations with people, even though it was not the most fun conversation to have at a cocktail party. Like, what are you working on? Well, I'm trying to end the backlog of untested rape kits. <laughs> you know, it's it's not it's not um, it's not a fun topic. And the reason that I did it, the reason that you know I, um, you know, opened up even new wounds for myself. The reason why I think someone like Fritzy and Sam and all the survivors um, continue to show up and tell their stories. Um, and with bravery and courage is because of this concept that we want these, our values to kind of continue on into the next generation so that they don't have to maybe suffer like we did. And that, you know, I think, you know, I, I'll just bring it personal to myself and you can all chime in as well. But you know, uh, I had been working in the Me Too, what we now call the Me Too movement for 30 years. And, you know, you think that there will never be movement in a an issue that you care about. You, you know, these movements are so slow to, you know, move the needle on. And I just thought I'd never see progress. And then, boom, out of the blue, not out of the blue, but it felt like it, the Me Too movement happens. And I think, wow, you know, I have been a part of creating a few tiles on this big mosaic of 
of human rights and you know something I can feel really proud of but it was specifically because of the birth of my daughters that I felt even more inclined and uh, with a sense of urgency to um, to move forward but it kind of goes against you know Nelson Mandela also believed in the long game and uh, you know I I guess it's part of it too I don't know how you guys think about that, but I just love this idea of like the next generation and like as so many survivors are leaving us, what role do we have to play as holders of their stories and um, remembering their stories and making sure that these, um, we know never again is truly never again. I don't know how you all think about that, but. Love Does anyone have questions or thoughts on the long game versus immediate movement? That's a concept we've seen from many speakers. Sherilyn Eiffel, who is head of the um, Legal Defense Fund for the NAACP, talked about that um, and how it can get really difficult because you don't see movement. But if you look at change through generations, change really does happen. So. I mean, as we think about ourselves, what we take on, our children, um, how, you know, any thoughts on how we impart to children that it is about the short, there's a short game and a long game. Any thoughts on how we reconcile that, how we communicate about that, how we work at that? Yeah, I don't know. I think it is just like telling, um, kind of telling the the stories, and um, I and that's why I always feel like you had to make those move, movements. You have to give people heart. You know that it can't just be an intellectual conversation, but that you move people with heart, which I think he also writes about that that that's. Um, kind of imparting on people um, through through their sentiments and, and their emotions and whatnot um, is sort of that you know I'd have to you have to make it personal um, to get people to I guess care anything in that this group wants to talk about related to the book or Social justice or Mandela or the museum, we'll just open it up. Yeah. Okay, I again I, I'm not from Chicago. Okay. I'm a little bit of an interloper, but I'm no, vice no not not at all. We're happy. That's why these are virtual. We've had people from all over the world all so right. thank you Good. for being yeah. here. So this isn't that far away. I'm vice president of an organization called the Jewish Study Center, and I've organized a lot of very interesting programs, including a couple of years ago with the Swedish ambassador to the US who had been ambassador to Hungary, where she got interested in Raoul Wallenberg. And that was a very interesting session here in Washington. But my question is, there are a number of Holocaust museums across the United States and in other parts of the world. Is there any network that brings them together? Uh, that would be interesting to know something about. Yeah, so we, yes and yes. So our museum is loosely associated with a group of, I would say the seven larger centers, not including the US Museum and our heads of education network and our CEOs network and we share ideas and those kinds of things. And then there are other organizations. Um, I'm gonna get the exact name wrong, but there's like the Association of Holocaust Educators. Um, again, probably don't have the exact title correct, but the, they hold a conference every year and get together and share learning and curriculum and those kinds of things. So there, there, are, um, there are networks amongst museums and educators to share curriculum challenges, best practices, ideas, um, and keep each other motivated, I guess, in working towards a common goal. Okay, uh, where are the Holocaust museums in countries you wouldn't expect them to be? 
Oh gosh. Uh, I think uh, almost every, I don't, I mean, I can't answer that. I know I'm much more familiar with the seven or eight that we work with in the U.S. Museum in Yad Vashem and the bigger centers. I think um, almost, there are many, many countries that have them, but I think you, that might be something that you would have to <laughs> work on yourself on Google. Okay. <sighs> what are we got about nine minutes before the top of the hour. Do you want to close it down or wrap it up or ask a last question or if someone has something they want to say, feel, feel free. Well, while, while you're waiting, what are these seven institutions that you work with? Oh gosh, okay, Dallas, Houston. Dallas, okay. Florida, uh, Museum of Jewish Heritage in New York. La there's Museum of Tolerance in the LA Holocaust Museum in LA. So those two, Skirball, uh, Maltz Museum in Cleveland. Um, Candles and oh, candles and Terra Haute. Terra Haute. Anything else, Michelle? I think that just about covers them. Okay. Great. Julie. Um. Well, I. You know, I think. Um. I guess I'll just read like a, a passage in closing that I think. Um, also just strikes me. Um, most people would say that Nelson Mandela personifies courage, but Mandela himself defines courage in a curious way. He does not see it as innate or as a kind of elixir we can drink or learned in any conventional way. He sees it as a way we choose to be. None of us is born courageous, he would say. It's all in how we react to different situations. There are moments when Mandela, in, in Mandela's life when he was tested, the ones people know about were large and public and dramatic, but courage, he would say, is an everyday activity that we can display it in ways large and small. And I, I really like that too. And um, it reminds me, I moderated a conversation with Dr. Edith Eager, who's a, a survivor as well. She's amazing, such an inspiration. I have her books um, and she writes about the choice too and how, you know, she's asked often, you know, how did you survive? Why did, how did you survive? How do you continue? Cause she's considers herself to be kind of a happy person. And she says, I just, I made the choice. I made the choice to thrive. I made the choice that, you know, I'm gonna find something great in every day and, um, I think that's another um, interesting thing to, um, oh, also I did wanna, I, I would love to hear what you all think about this, uh, the, not to go back and opening up as we're trying to close, but one of, the, one of the things that I also thought was so interesting was that he really did not believe in a higher power. And I thought that was interesting because I think for so many people who are in such a, traumatizing um experience situation that i think i think like survivors of really difficult situations are one of the most spiritual groups of people and um you know look to a higher power to help them get through whatever they're going through or to bring them comfort and i think it's interesting that he actually did not believe in any kind of higher power deity or anything like that. And um, that it was very much more realistic or pragmatic for him. Um, and I thought that was really surprising. I mean, I would have expected him, you know, he doesn't pray, he doesn't, I, I, I thought that, I'm curious what you all think about that concept because I was surprised about that actually. I don't know how you all feel, but that brought me a surprise. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, uh, 
you know, I think this idea of courage every day, small acts of courage, and what we try to teach at the museum with being an upstander, not a bystander, and, you know, helping the young ones, um, the little ones learn about that concept and the lessons of, of both the Holocaust or the lessons of Mandela are about courage. And, um, you know, over, over the, the weeks that I've been kind of diving into Mandela's life, like he was very honest about the times that he was um, afraid, but he really didn't show it. Um, and I think that's one of the important other really, I mean, there's so many important lessons from Mandela. Um, we could just go on and on and on. But I think that that's one of the other big ones that, you know, courage is not the absence of fear, but the idea of like feeling fear and then still being brave, even with fear. Um, and I think that's just so important now more than ever again, as, um, as we, you know, bring in a new generation of, uh, of people, of, of uh, humanitarians and um, people fighting for social justice that, you know, we often look at these people and think they're so brave, so courageous, but it, it's not with absence of fear that you yeah. feel the fear and do it. Well, Julie, that's a perfect transition to me to close out this session, um, I want to thank everyone for being here and actually mention our next program, which is Thursday night. And that is the opening program, which is a survivor panel. Um, it's an opening program for our newest exhibition called uh, Shanghai Safe Haven During the Holocaust and tells a little known story of re stateless refugees who found a life in Shanghai. Um, during the Holocaust. And so this exhibition features 10 survivor stories and also photographs by Arthur Rothstein, who is world renowned, um, mostly for his dust bowl pictures and others, but he worked for UNESCO mm -hmm. and went and um, took these pictures. And so one part of the exhibition includes the photos of life in Shanghai and the other part of the exhibition includes the stories of these survivors. But on Thursday at 6.30, um, three different survivors of the ghetto will talk about their experiences and their family's experiences. And I think living day to day with fear in horrible circumstances, and you know, many of them have positive remembrances. So it will be interesting to hear um, them speak and Ariel, our chief curator, will be moderating. So if you're interested, it is a virtual panel. Please, um, you can register at our links at our website at ilholocaustmuseum.org and they'll send over a link. So um, with that, I want to thank Julie, our moderator, for doing such a great job and Michelle for helping um, moderate the conversation and all of our guests and hope we'll see you at an upcoming of a museum event. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Such an honor to be with you.